Good morning and welcome everyone to this important appointment here with the ISPRA and the EEAR that together will introduce three reports that will give us an idea of the state of our environment, the Italian one, with a focus on regions and the European one, the SOER for 2020 has now reached its sixth edition. It's been, it was published last year in December with a slight anticipation and was also in view of the European Green Deal, a zero impact Europe on the environmental conditions. And this will be possible only if we adopt bold measures. So how we can perform this and how we're doing, uh, w the yearbook will tell us this. And this has obviously also taken into account the COVID-19 virus. And this has been long known by scientists that keeping on the economic activity does not necessarily improve the consequences for our environment. The social cost that COVID-19 has brought us is obviously tremendous. And there is a third document that I'm going to talk about, the uh, system report, which will focus on some regional issues. But without further ado, I will now welcome our honorable guests. We have from remote the president of the European Parliament, David de Sassoli. Good morning ev to everyone. The Prime Minister, the Italian Prime Minister, Giuseppe Conte. Good morning to everyone from Copenhagen. The Executive Director of the EEA, Mr. Brunig. Good morning. From Rome, we have at the ISPRA office, and obviously following all the rules under the pandemic, we have uh, the Minister for the Environment, Sergio Costa, and also the uh, Chief of the Institute is here with us. Later, in a second phase of uh, this event, we will have Mr. Bratti and also Mr. Pepe, the Vice President of the SMPA. But obviously, we would like to remind everyone following us on the social media and from uh, remote, where you can post online questions for our speakers, and we will try to um, ask them for you and provide you with the answers as soon as possible. Obviously, the ones that are unanswered, well, you can write to SOAR2020 at ispraambiente.it and send us your questions there. Obviously, this uh, will all be available in the public domain. And now I would like to yield the floor to uh, the President Laporta for the initial greetings. And he will also say a couple of things on the reports, on the reports and also state, tell us how they're positive or not. Good morning, everyone. I would like first to thank, on behalf of the Institute on the National System, which I chair, the president of the the president of the president of the European Environment Agency, also our European stakeholders here, and I would like to thank you for being here with us in these days that are still kind of hard to manage, but we are moving forward. We never thought that we would present those reports in this particular fashion, but in this very delicate period for our country and for the entire world, we had no other chance. But I would like also to uh, say that I'm very satisfied that we still managed to provide a platform for this very important information. I would also like to add that during this month, we have all reevaluated, sometimes even rediscovered some of the uh, fundamental values that are part of our daily life, and we have understood how sustainability, not, and this holds true not just for the environment, is not one of the opportunity, but the single biggest opportunity for the uh, restart of our country. What used to be an option now has become an imperative, and um, President von der Leyen has stated this uh, when speaking to the uh, EU, and President von der Leyen has also stated that no one was really ready for all this. 
and she has also asked for the starting point for an economy now to be in order to make them more more sustainable, more resilient to be the environment. So Pope Francis in uh Laud in the encyclica Laudato Si on the past twenty fourth of March has uh, started a year of reflection in order to keep up the uh thinking, the thought process of the encyclica in 2015, and it's a pope who invited us to fight, to fight for the environment, to safeguard what he himself defined as our common home. And you, President Sassoli, have said this yourself multiple times, that the political leaders have a responsibility and have to act boldly and swiftly in order to master the challenges ahead and to come out of this crisis stronger than before. I would like also to remind everyone uh, the words of the Prime Minister who has always endorsed a more a better transition to an ecological um, renewal and has stated that among the fundamental principles there have to be the protection of the environment and that we should all follow these when making policies the attention on the, from our institutions to environmental topics is always reminded to us by the president Mattarella who has given us the honor uh, of attending a event from our agency last year and he also talked about the objectives the goals that we set for ourselves and also considering the last COP25 we have to safeguard the environment, especially the young people that are adamant about doing so. And this has to become concrete in our daily lives. It doesn't have to stay just in the books. So we have to reconsider our relation with the environment. We have to reconsider how we relate to nature, to its inhabitants, in order to avoid that situation such as this one may repeat. I think that this is the direction, this is the path that we need to take, and that's why research is fundamental in this. If there is another lesson that we learn from this uh, health emergency, emergency is that we need to implement and invest in research, in publicly funded research. And the responsible for this has given an important impulse to the Republic. And I would like to add that this is important. It is an added value for research that it is shared, that it is also at the service of the country. And it's the same impulse that is important for our national system as a whole. It is important to conduct research, to have mapping protocols in place in order to safeguard the environment. And we need shared standard here. So I would like to say with uh, a bit of pride that the guidelines approved by the National Council for the National System for the Protection of the Environment have been all approved unanimously by all general direct directors who are part of the National Council. I would like to just start with a couple of examples that are particularly important that have been on, on, on issues and topics that have been greatly debated. For instance, the instructions for the sanitation of the street during the emergency. Also, the uh, indications for the uh, classification and recycling of uh, urban waste. And we have a new document also on the on how to recycle and dispose of the um, the masks and the gloves we need for protection. Today, uh, we will present the yearbook of the ISPA and uh, of the directory of the uh, protection system of the environment. This is a collaboration of experts and institutions. Those are obviously documents that are not just well done, but they are at the service of this country. We give, we provide indicators that give us an idea of what the state, the situation of our uh, environment is currently and how we should proceed. I will not um, go into detail on this, but I will move on with, uh, with what the um, European agency will share with us they will give us uh, guidelines for how to achieve these strategic goals for 2020. And I would like to just repeat what is our common message that is shared by all these reports. I think that there is one clear message. Without an immediate intervention within the next years, we will not be able to reach our goals. 
despite all the success we've had previously. But in order to achieve these goals, we need, we are in dire need to a of a transformation of the old European system, transforming it by incrementing the new systems, by f uh, fostering circular economy, protecting the environment. So this presentation of the reports is in a very particular moment where all institutions are looking at new options and soon we will also start implementing the Italian New Green Deal. So we will have to make out of this moment a chance to relaunch our economy, looking at biodiversity, looking at the environment, safeguarding them because they are still substantially under threat and they keep being under threat. So we have to move towards a transformation that involves the industry, economy, and also cultural. We need to keep our guard up. And this is the final part of my statement. We keep hearing this, that we need to keep our guard, our guard up. And I think it is in order to do so, not only because of the health crisis we're living through, it's, it's in general. And we all have important roles to play. We all face challenges. And we need to lead the country towards this, and Europe towards this sustainable, sustainable new system that we need for our restart, our economic restart. And from this prestigious event, I would like to um, say that the National Institute for the Protection of the Environment is ready to lead the way. And I think that all citizens and all other institutions are on our side and are equally prepared. So I'd like to thank everyone for being with us. And I wish you good work. Thank you very much. Thank you, President Laporta. Now I'll give the floor to President Sassoli, who is listening to us and following us. I will ask him a um, preliminary consideration. Before COVID emergency, we were talking about a huge investment plan with the European Green Deal. So an investment plan helping European countries towards a sustainable industry and would bring Italy to reach net zero emissions by 2050. The question is the following one. In light of the emergency of COVID, is that plan still going on? Are these targets still achievable? Thank you very much. Good morning. I First of all, I want to thank you for having invited me. I believe that keeping the debate is really important and not stopping us before difficulties that we are unfortunately experiencing. We've started at the beginning of this legislation a year ago. We thought, what is the key? How could we rid our contemporary times and the key, the lens, came us quite naturally. I mean, saving the planet by investing in sustainability and driving for a change, looking for a change in relation in uh, economical and social relationship. So by investing into quality, into a um, higher social model, that will be actually the one having better results. That's our site over the theme. That's the site that this European legislation had. And as a matter of fact, after a couple of months, uh, after the, the formation of the uh, commission, the presentation of the um, Green Deal was a fundamental and huge starting point for our action. As we all know, this was a slightly slowed down because of pandemics, because of the hardships. No one was really waiting for this to happen. No one really expected for the whole world, not Italy and Europe, but the whole world to stop by. So today we need to reiterate some of the uh, ground principle. That's why that site, that outlook, these goals and ambitions can't stop. Last week we. Uh, had we witnessed um, in the parliament the presentation by um, President von der Leyen of the Recovery Fund, and we believe that this will be the possibility 
to support, to back up that economical boost that we are in need of right now, both our society and our continent. We can't allow leaving behind, though, the programs that were important for us from the beginning of the legislation. They were already on the table and they shouldn't be left behind. Before us, dear President, I want to greet President Conte. We have before us a really important challenge, the possibility to have a new Europe that is fairer Europe, that answers to the criteria, that side that we had a year ago when we believe that saving the planet was the right way. A greener, more digital, fairer Europe projected into the future. And this uh, was also what was support what was said by President Laporta to come up with projects for the next 10 years. We can avoid these challenges. We are also convinced that environmental challenges ahead of us. Let us think of uh, loss of biodiversity, the collapse of eco ecosystem services, pollution, climate change. I believe that these factors might lead us to a more convenient and different development. We are fully aware of the irreversible loss of a number of species until extinction, way beyond what some scientists believed, are, believed for our ecosystem to be sure, certain. We are in the brink of a climate disaster. Until 25 years ago, the European Aid Environmental Agency and the European Observation Network have gathered and analyzed the data, and they turned them into knowledge, information, to support the decision-making process and to raise awareness. This cooperation, this work has been really important. The agency provides us with this know-how, the technical advice, and starting from 2003, the fight against climate change. And we're talking about life of millions of people living in the, in the Union. This was set up, and that was the ambition to protect human health, the environment, and to make the European Union safer. And the situation brought by pandemics recalls us to stick to these goals. In the last years, having adopted most of the um, environmental uh, norms, laws, the set of things that the agency has to do I am a huge supporter of the European agency. It acts as a unique actor between the different institutions of the European Union. A really important case on that note is of member states, of regional authorities, where well, all these entities have to make sure that the regulatory framework of the Union work, they have the necessary scientific contribution. The work that we provided was very important on a several set of themes. In Italy, as for all member states, there's the we have equal access to higher level of expertise and knowledge because the best experts of the Union through EONET, so the Network on Information and Observation on Environment. What does it happen that e every five years the agency presents um, an in-depth analysis on a European level from the beginning of December? Dr. Brunick, that I sent my regards to, the executive director is going to talk about these findings later on. Well, this report reaches us at a very 
pivotal moment of the European Union. We have fundamental uh, challenges ahead of us. We saw that some policies brought fundamental benefits in the last 10 years. What we need now is a bold action from the whole union to face climate change. And from this I want to stress the importance of a new moral leadership of the European Union, a world moral leadership. That's the role we can play. Reach a net zero content, reaching a net zero emission continent is the challenge for the future. That's why in November, the European Parliament declared a environmental climate climate emergency and that we couldn't uh, turn a blind eye on this like we did on the past fundamental changes dealing with our society as a whole and in order for us to 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 make it in the green transition no one has to left behind has to be left behind we have to work differently in several sectors in different countries we have to reduce greenhouse gas. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Mr. President. Europe is dealing with this climate emergency and is trying its best to get to a better, sustainable future. And Europe has to consider that social dimension is important. As a matter of fact, the environmental challenges can be solved only if we tackle the the matter of social inequalities because they are intertwined only this will allow us to protect our citizens and our societies working for a fairer society is possible it's convenient we just have to explain it to our governments to our institutions to our decision makers because a society made of inequalities where a huge part of populations are living in poverty well of course this is responsible for the economical crisis there are also companies that have presented new contracts for the protection of their workers that's why I'm sending a shout out since we're talking about something Italian. I don't know if you've seen the um, interactive data published by the agency, which have been published in the last weeks. They show the impacts of the increase of the sea level in high and low emissions. Some of these are really dangerous perspectives and outlooks that have to be considered seriously. We have to act to alleviate, alleviate the risks, to mitigate the risk for our population that might have to face when it comes to droughts, when it comes to floods, and other environmental hazards for the 33 countries of the economic um, economic European space, the agency estimates a loss of many millions per year. That means that we have reached a tipping point, and tipping points are real. But there are also some good news, and we have the right to say these news and to share them and to spread them. 12%. There has been a um, reduction by 12% tw tw of coal fired energy. And also, 2019 has been a fundamental year because, for the first year, the European Union gave more circular electricity rather than using coal powered plants. The European Union is at the forefront for climate, and we were happy 
to see that many international bodies refer to us, to what I said, uh, this mo world leadership, so that young people uh, have the these matters dear to their heart. These are driving changes that we all need. Let, let us think of the way we eat, the way we dress up. Let us think of the very air we breathe and its quality. We can see this on a global level. Radical changes have, are occurring for hair quality in China as well, thanks to mobilization of its own citizens. So I will be optimistic, but cautiously so. And I will um, listen to the advices that the experts are going to give me as to reach a more sustainable future. So I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart. Uh, I want to send my greetings uh, to President Conte and the ministers. I will be glad to listen to them. And of course, I think that the quiet, uh, life standards will increase. But only if you're ready to be those on the front line then we will really make it. Of course, I'm talking about you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. I'm sorry to say that, but we kind of missed some of, what, of the things you said. But uh, these are the contraindications of presentation in the COVID era. I want to thank you, though, because we realized your message as a whole, um, optimistic message that we are absolutely proud to share. Now, I'll give the floor to President Giuseppe Conte, which in this historical moment has the fundamental role to drive Italy out of one of the most dangerous and one of the most severe crises after the Second World War, and has to do it in a moment where Italy, alongside European states, engage itself in a green reboost. So in this um, 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 reboost decree, um, what's the role of the environment? First of all, thank you very much and good morning. Let me send my greetings to President Sassoli. I'm sorry, we are experiencing uh, technical difficulties at the moment, also receiving uh, its, um, its voice. Wait a second, I'll ask the technicians to check. Can you hear me now? You just missed the greetings uh, to President Sassoli and to Hans Brunig and of course to the president of uh, ESPRA La Porta. Are you following me? Right. I was saying the attention towards the environment, environment plays a pivotal role. We have cared for these themes of the New Deal, so renewable energies, so towards this tra energetic transition. We are fully aware that we have to turn the productive system into this transition. And this is a l enormous situation. And it might be also engaging one for the economical point of view, even though our return will be really important. I want to say that so the, politic, the policies that have been pr announced at the beginning of the commission, I agree we are in line with this. I would say that the projects, pol political projects and social and economic um, policies are in line with our own policies. So I would say that in 
the parliament itself, there are many people raising their voice on this, as the President Sassoli said. So, so this uh, conference was to happen at the end of February, but was postponed because of COVID-19. And with the, the dramatic consequences that this emergency is bringing both on life and also on economy, So we were given a positive data. So there's a, an increasement in quality of air and environmental conditions. Of course, we can resort to extraordinary cases in, extra, in situations like this one. But it's up to us to engage ourselves fully to reach this goal. I would say that the environment has to be integrated in any politic any policies at any level, because the link between the environment and policies deal with support to life, supply chain. So pollination, control of foods and beer, and also protector of biodiversity, and also recreational activities. These are all the functions played by the environment. On this point, Minister Costa has played a central role. I think that beforehand, environment was seen as a limit. But the environmental politics is seen now as an important and positive uh, way ahead for the government. We have a lot of job before us on in domestic, on European and international level. For too long, we um, turned a blind eye on this. And I'm talking about the develop, development model. We, so far, we, we had a development mode which, which, was really, which was really detrimental, which brought to climate crisis, which brought to the increase of inequalities, because often it is the case that Social inequalities, for example, is left behind, but these is linked with the environmental crisis. They are intertwined. So this, uh, the outcome of uh, the kind of incapacity of politics in general to consider also collective well-being. Let's say that they believe these things to be separate, but they are not. So we have to take new life out of this and inspire our action. And also the scientific data are helpful for this. The contribution made by ISPRA with the yearbook of 2019, 2020 state of the environment in Europe, the environmental report 2019. 19, these give us the pillars, updated data that pushes us and stimulate us to work with a further engagement to transform our economy and our society. When it comes to our country, I was saying that we're really engaged to have a political view fully focused on ecological tran transition. On this point of view, I fully agree with what has been said with President Sassoli. I use the same expression. I'm, I'm glad that without having de decided beforehand, we use the same expression. That's exactly what I said, leadership. One of the European Council I attended, which was about the environment and climate change, I invited my colleague, European colleagues to consider that now, for the old continent, so to say, once we lost the economical record, so to say, we have the role to have a world leadership when it comes to environmental protection. So we can prove an enormous 
momentum and enormous strength. So to be a reference point, reference point for the other countries. We are, of course, still linked with our values, and we still have to defend them. Let us think of the rule of law, the protection of fundamental rights. But maybe today is the time to have a new vision. Our companies have contributed and are still contributing on this. There's a higher and higher sensibilization for three fundamental priorities highlighted by the seventh EAP. Protect the natural capital, have a low carbon economy, which is efficient, resource efficient, protect the health and the well-being of our citizens. We have to keep on working on this. And to conclude, I don't want to take you, I don't want to take further time to conclude my intervention, to give you a real witness on how methodology is important. We have clear goals before us, which might look like revolutionary. I created a control room, which is called Wellbeing Italy, Benessere Italia, that is working alongside me with the president, with the presidency. So each evaluation, each plan, each hypothesis is actually in kind of worked out by them as well, so that we can better find problems and gaps to have a fair and sustainable well-being. This is important. So the Committee for the Economical Program Programmation Planning, it becomes cheapest. So it adds, at the final part of the word, a reference to sustainable development. That means that everything will be everything economically related will deal with sustainable development. So also infrastructure-wise, they will be part of sustainable development. They were born this way, and they are adopted this way in the, in the decision-making process. Well, we have to reach the seventh EAP, the seventh target, so living well within the limits of the planet within a circular economy by protecting the biodiversity in a society which is resilient to climate change. On this point of view, I always say to recall the formula used by Hans Jonas. This is a huge responsibility. This is a principle of responsibility that is important for any policymaker. And this is an intergenerational deal. We seize the responsibility in the outlook that on this earth, we are temporary. We're just a lightning in time. And we have to make sure that those coming after us will have the same conditions that we had. Thank you very much. Thank you, Prime Minister, for leaving us this message of hope, of optimism. I would like to w like to quit again, to say goodbye to the President and to Mr. Sassoli, and I thank them once again for being for having shared this day with us, this discussion, an important occasion for the discussion around the environment. Thank you for having been with us. Now we get back here to our minister, Sergio Costa. So what we've heard from the prime minister and uh, presidents of the European Parliament. So those were words of hope. So what is the position of Italy within the general context and this idea of improvement? Well, first of all, the SOER data include more than just the EU territory. It has a broader scope. 
it's more than those countries because they go beyond the geographic boundaries of Europe. So this, these are pieces of information. This is data. This is very important. They are collected over five years. So it's a long-term collection. It's important. And it's, it, this is a time lapse that gives us some significant information. And I think Italy is not really in a bad position here because we have to look at data from a absolute point of view. But we also have to look at the trend. How are things evolving? How are they changing? Now, let's consider on, on a couple of topics. Let me give some examples, like biodiversity. It's a topic um, that I like to quote because there is a, a new, uh, there's new data it's been by the European Commission just a couple of days ago. There was the presentation of the new strategy for the biodiversity of the EU. And it tells us a lot of things, actually. It, on the one side, tells us that all countries have a deficit in the biodiversity safeguarding. Italy is ranked. Uh, we have more than 60,000 species and subspecies, uh, over 12,000 in uh, flora. So we're one of the countries with the highest rate of biodiversity, uh, whilst and this is worldwide, whilst, whilst being relatively small in terms of economy. So we are in a positive trend, but we still need to keep growing, and there are parameters to follow. Uh, one that we embraced immediately because we helped the Commission to propose this strategy plan for the safeguarding of the biodiversity. We think of the protected areas both on land and on uh, the ma marine sector. So recently, well, basically, from when I started my activities, I have uh, signed more than uh, 2,000 um, declarations for protected areas. So we are clearly moving forward and at a fast pace, safeguarding biodiversity and the new strategy, they are paired with, with the farm to fork strategy. So the close link between agriculture, environment, and biodiversity. Because agriculture has to become an ally of the other two. But this requires certain conditions to be met. So for instance, reducing by 50% uh, pesticides, because we know how, what a bad influence they have on the environment. Let's say that if we lose a species, we are losing a piece of DNA. And let's be honest, this means losing it forever. It's irreversible. It's not like you can get it back. Losing a species, a subspecies, on a genetics level means that the loss is irretrievable. And this impacts not only the environment, but also on nature and what means to be natural a natural world, and this also impacts human beings. And this is something new. This is something that we pushed for a lot. And this has been implemented shortly before the lockdown started. We started on the 4th of um, March. I remember it because I was in Brussels. So I was talking uh, there at the parliament. And this is the other important player here, um, the parliament. We were talking about the new uh, climate and environment laws of the, of the European Parliament. So this will be a point of no return. This will be change everything because it pushes you towards pursuing new objectives in the EU and at a domestic level. What are uh, the GHG emissions? On suggestion of the commission, uh, commission, Italy is one of the most ambitious countries also, and we have a proven track record for this. So we want to see what is the impact of the for what the 40 percent emission level means right now and how we can have it drill down and what that means for the environment this means that there has to be a change a change in speech and a change a change in deeds we have respected the timetable for the uh, climate laws now they're being approved but we're already looking forward at the next one coming because we have now a leadership, as President Sassoli mentioned, as well as Prime Minister Conte. We have a European leadership that we want to have and we want to keep at high standards. And let's think for a moment at Italy. 
Italy that has suggested the super eco bonus of 110% on the um, energy savings of domestic housing. So this is essentially linking economy and environment. This means taking action and also putting the citizen at the center of it, having initiative also swapping over to them. And the environment profits greatly from this. So this is, in my opinion, the other fundamental pillar. So we have to remember that 85% of the um, what we have in terms of structures of buildings here is old in terms of energy standards. And this can be the starting point for a real change, improving this. And this requires for us to also think that we don't uh, do have to stop keep consuming using new soil we need because this this provoked a loss a loss of soil we put concrete on it so it means we lost it so what does our new policy towards it means that we regenerate we reuse soil so we don't build new stuff we simply reuse regenerate what is old now in order to transform it into a new canon a new model something modern so there are there is the link between these two models. And then there's a third one, the new mobility. I have fought greatly together with the Minister for Economic Development and the Minister for Infrastructure, which what we call the bicycle bonus. It's basically a bonus for sustainable traveling because it's a new way of conceiving mobility, transport, particularly in the big cities that are not just slowed down and uh, polluted by the uh, by the tons of cars that are circulating because like the short roads of everyday life home to school home to office you can do that by going by bike using an e-bike using other means of transport that are electrical because doing this means changing our perspective on mobility and finally facing one of the big topics the big issues in cities which is a sustainable mobility going from a to b in a sustainable way and I could, keeping on and on, I could speak about waste, I could speak about um, depuration systems, cleaning systems. So we are currently under a breach of the water safety standards in four cases, but we have renegotiated those terms and we have already implemented new strategies in order to get out of this state of breach to improve the water quality. We have a new commissar, uh, commissioner on this and we did this together with the EU because we want to walk side by sides. We want to be co-leaders. We want to give a new outlook, a new way of safeguarding the environment, which does still not mean more costs and less efficient economy. It is silly. It is silly to think that in order to improve economy, you have to put the environment at a loss and vice versa. We can have the best of both worlds. Thank you very much. I'd like to Thank you sincerely for this very clear, very interesting little speech. And that tells us that Italy is moving towards the right direction. Never, nevertheless, we're still living in a particularly dif difficult moment. But anyway, before we get into the presentation of the three reports that we already announced this morning, uh, already giving you a glimpse of what's within, we would like to show you a little video with the greetings of with the greetings from uh, the president of the commission, Ursula von der Leyen. Uh, but before seeing the video, uh, I'd like for our two guests here to say about, because we're going to start with the second part directly after the afterwards. And yeah, I'll leave the floor to you. Yeah. Thank you very much again for your attention and for taking part in this uh, special occasion. And as the minister said, our uh, he is the host here, so to speak. So being here f with us is obviously a particular sign of his attention. So I'd like to thank him for this. And Mr. Mr. Minister, thank you. Thank you for ISPRA for this uh, wonderful day, for this wonderful opportunity. And also thank to all the people who have collected the data, all the research personnel all over Europe in Italy that have collected this data, that studied it, and that are sharing them with us in order to reflect and in order to put the political players in a position to make the best possible decision. Thank you to both of you, and let's go with the video. Each of us.
We're changing our way of life to protect our own health and that of others. We may miss many things that are dear to us, but we don't miss the air pollution from cars or the noise of traffic. When we throw open our windows, we can breathe fresher air. We see nature restoring itself. But we shouldn't fool ourselves. We may be getting a better grip on the coronavirus, but we are not getting a grip yet on climate change. The warming of our planet continues. And it will warm even more if we continue to burn fossil fuels. As we now plan to slowly go back to work and to invest billions of euros to restart our economy, we should avoid falling back in old, polluting habits. Instead, we should bounce back better from this pandemic. We can make our society and our planet healthier by investing in renewable energy, by driving clean cars, by renovating our houses and making them energy efficient by buying sustainable food, reusing materials rather than throwing them away, or producing low-carbon steel. This is the essence of the European Green Deal. The European Green Deal is an agenda for transforming our economy to make it more competitive and improve our quality of life. We will now also make it our motor for the recovery. By using the European Green Deal as our compass, we can turn the crisis of this pandemic into an opportunity to rebuild our economies differently and make them more resilient, so that we also leave a better place for our children. With a green recovery, we will come out of the crisis stronger and healthier. So this was the message that Ursula von der Leyen wanted to give us for this meeting. I want to thank the executive director, Alessandro Bratti, of the SNPA, and the vice president of for the protection of the environment, uh, Carlo Manuel Pepe. Good morning. And from Copenhagen. We have the executive director of the European Agency of the Environment. We said at the beginning of the morning that the role which is played by the Commission for the European Green Deal is strongly f uh, influenced by the studies and inquiries carried out by the EEA. The SOA 2020 is a fundamental report to policies on the environmental portfolio. So let us listen to the presentation from Hans Brunig himself that is going to speak in English. Good morning, uh, dear colleagues in Italy, and that includes, of course, uh, Director General Bratti, uh, President Stefano Laporta, the Minister, and not least uh, President Sassoli and uh, the Prime Minister Conte. It is, a, it is a pleasure and an honor to share the findings of the State and Outlook of the Environment Report 2020. And as has been mentioned before, this is not the first uh, report that we are doing. Every five years, and this for the sixth time in a row, we bring together our best knowledge about the European environment and climate, and we link it to policy performance in Europe. And that is exactly what we did in this report. What is different uh, in this report is, I think, the context. The European Green Deal is probably the most fertile ground that we have had in 25 years of reporting to come with this type of knowledge. And I think the report is a strong science-based and data-based underpinning of why, indeed, we have to go to a low-carbon circular economy with strong natural capital and biodiversity, focus on limiting pollution for human health and the health of the environment, but also doing it in a way that stimulates the economy and social justice. All of those are critical elements of the European Green Deal, as was also explained by President Ursula von der Leyen in her intervention. It also means that this report is not just a report. It is part of a process. It is part of a process with very strong political engagement, also towards the post-corona uh, time period. 
It is a report that intends to provide strong policy support, but also wants to be useful for stakeholders, those involved in actually making the changes that will be needed if we want to become more uh, sustainable at a European level. It was already mentioned by the minister that indeed we are not detached from global uh, evolution. If you look at the, the global panels of scientists that bring knowledge to global policymaking settings, we can look at the IPCC report on climate change, which has been very clear on the necessity to absolutely live up to the Paris Agreement commitments of staying well below two degrees and preferably aim for 1.5 degrees centigrade. The IPBES, the Panel on Biodiversity and Ecosystems, has been warning about what it's called the sixth great extinction, the loss of species and biodiversity on this planet. And the lesser known but not less important International Resource Panel is looking at our resource use and how it impacts the two previous elements. All of these reports come to very similar conclusions. First of all, urgent action is needed. This is indeed a pivotal decade to turn things around. Secondly, we are already dealing with irreversibilities, which means that we are at a stage where we are actually dealing with damage and we are trying to limit the damage in this irreversible new type of planetary environment. On top of that, we are witnessing tipping points, which are potentially speeding up negative change. And that puts another emphasis on the urgency. And these things are interconnected, which means that if we fail on climate change, we will fail on biodiversity and the other way around. And if we don't change our resource use, we will fail on those two as well. To illustrate this, I would like to show this little since the late 19th century, we see the temperature fluctuating on the planet. And some climate skeptics would say, well, it is indeed clear that uh, this is a natural system with lower and higher temperatures. It's happening after World War II, and we are now into the 1970s when Mao dies in China, and we start to see what we call now globalization. And we are around the turn of the century now. And we go to 2010, and we are now in 2017. I think the planet is rather clear. Business as usual is no longer the case, even if some think still today that business as usual is a policy option, it is clearly not an ecosystemic option. On to the European level now. In our State and Outlook of the Environment report, we look at the past trends of European policies and how they relate to the qualities of the environment. And we call this the piano of the European environment. And each key, you could say, is a set of policies for which we have data that we collect together with our partners in the countries. And I think it's clear that where we are moving in the right direction is where we are moving towards a more low carbon and resource efficient economy. Yeah where we are failing for the most part is on protecting the fundamental natural capital on this planet. And if you look towards the future, 2030, and that is the span also of the European Green Deal in first instance, it's obvious that the green disappears. Now for a region that is world leading in environment and climate policies, this cannot be the goal. And the message here is not that European policies are not working, the core message is that the systems of production and consumption, which are the fundamental drivers of unsustainability, are in many cases stronger than the more segmented policies that we have taken until now. The other message is, of course, that the future does not have to look like this. If we make the right policy choices, we would see much less red and much more green. And that is, of course, the objective of the European Green Deal. Let's first look at natural capital, the foundational capital. Well, if you look at past trends, the first column, we see that in many cases, European policies have not shown uh, to result in positive trends. The two green ones is where we are protecting more nature areas. And that is, of course, a very positive evolution. 
But if you look at the 2020 column there for policy objectives and targets, we, we see actually that there is a big implementation gap. And that is not the role of the institutions in Brussels. This is the role of the national institutions, where in many cases we still see lacking implementation of what we have all agreed to at the European level. And this results, of course, also in trend lines that are not necessarily very positive. We see a, re a, sm a slowdown in the loss of bird species, especially when it comes to forest bird species that are uh, rebounding a bit. But if we look at farmland birds, we see a decline in the last 25 years of 32%. The same is true with pollinators, and we take here the grassland butterflies as the, the core index with a decline of 40%. And if you look at the habitats data, you see that most habitats in Europe are not in good shape. So these are indicators of natural capital that is not going in the right direction in many places. And it is also clear in very important parts of these, this natural capital like water bodies where a large number of them in Europe are actually in poor ecological status. And this is due to pollution. This is due to water abstraction, which is increasingly under conditions of climate change an issue, but also uh, some changes, physical changes and hydrological pressures on water bodies. So we still have a long way to go to reach good ecological status in Europe's river basins. And the importance of water, I think, to all of us is very clear. If we look at land and soil, and you could say this is fundamental for all human activities, a healthy land and soil system, this is also under multiple pressures. If we look at land and soil and the, the spatial pattern of uh, how we see losses of land uh, that is uh, being covered by concrete or lost due to other activities, this is the map of Europe. And it's clear that where the pressures are, it's either urban sprawl, but it's also uh, the increase in infrastructure, increased landscape fragmentation, which also has a big impact on biodiversity and the potential for biodiversity and ecosystems to rebound, but also soil degradation and contamination. We are losing the vibrant and necessary capacities of soil biodiversity through the practices that we have in terms of uh, agricultural practices, but also other land uses, as I have mentioned. When it comes to resources, and as I said, resources are critical uh, when we think of uh, biodiversity and climate change, we look at the following picture. We are indeed moving in Europe more and more towards a resource efficient and circular economy and also a low carbon economy. I will come back to that. But there are still some issues as I can show at the lower part of the 2020 policy objectives where we have poor implementation. And that is mostly on emissions from chemicals and on water uh, when it comes to uh, the use uh, of that. One good message is indeed that we see recycling rates in Europe generally improving. And I, I put the red box around Italy with Italy, one of the countries where we see very significant improvements between 2004 and 2017. So that is good news. The other uh, element, however, is that if you look at the evolution of the European gross domestic product, we still see that waste generation outpaces the average pollution. So we produce more waste, but we recycle it better. That is the mixed picture that we have to deal with. And if we really want to go to a circular economy and a low carbon economy, we will have to uh, reverse the trend of waste generation. Good news is that resource efficiency, which means that we produce more economic output per kilo of uh, domestic material consumption is uh, improving quite significantly. And Italy here is a country that again has made very significant improvements over the last 
uh, 20 years. In overall, we see an increase in Europe of 40%. The flip side of the coin is that if we look at the circular economy, that we are at this moment only at 12% of circular material use in Europe, and we see a very slow improvement. So the circular economy 2.0 package, which is an integral and critical part of the European Green Deal, uh, should really bend the curve here and stimulate the breakthrough of a really circular use of materials in Europe. Climate change, we have mentioned it already as one of the most important challenges of our times and of the next century. And if we look at where we are there, I think the positive news is that with the reference year 1990, that Europe has in fact been successful in cutting emissions. We have cut domestic emissions by minus 23%, while we've seen the European economy grow by almost 60%, which means that decoupling your greenhouse gas emissions from economic performance is possible. We will reach the 2020 targets on greenhouse gas emissions, but Europe has the ambition in the Green Deal and in the climate law to become the first climate neutral continent. And if you look at the blue shaded area here, which would be European policies and national policies that are currently planned, we see that we would not reach that climate neutrality, which is of course the significance of the debate that is taking place in the Parliament and in the Council now to move to minus 50 and minus 55 percent uh, of emission cuts in 2030, 2030, because that opens up pathways to indeed uh, be in line with the Paris Agreement and be in line with the ambitions of the European Green Deal. In terms of impacts, it is also absolutely need to commit to the Paris Agreement. These are uh, numbers about the frequency of heat waves projected for the end of this century. And you, if you look at the Mediterranean region, uh, heat waves will become an endemic part of uh, life for many months of the year there. And that, of course, has impacts on human health and also on the other side of the slide, impacts on agricultural yields, where we see in the Mediterranean area losses of uh, rain-fed maize yields that are 20, 30, 40, and up to 50%, which of course sends a strong signal to the farming community about adaptation uh, and to uh, all of us about the importance of strong mitigation measures. When we look at health and well-being, and I think this is a critical if we want to speak to European citizens about the necessity to move towards a more sustainable society, because it will be a society that improves health and well-being. We can tell that there is a picture that is a bit mixed. We see serious green colors when it comes to past trends in air pollution. We see a more mixed color when it comes to uh, uh, noise pollution and to chemical. Uh, pollution, and we see some uh, improvements when it comes to climate adaptation, uh, but we see uh, concerning trends when it comes to sticking to policy objectives and delivering overall. The good news is indeed that air pollution has been improving in Europe almost everywhere and in a consistent way. On the other hand, we know that the World Health Organization air quality guidelines uh, stipulate that more than 80% of European urban citizens are still living in uh, air pollution uh, and air quality that is not good for their health, which makes us conclude that at this moment more than 450,000 Europeans die prematurely because of air quality in the places where they live. It is, of course, a goal of the European institutions to increasingly align policies with these health standards over time. And it has an impact, of course, on years of life lost. And if you look at the map of Europe, it is clear that uh, the Eastern European countries are struggling there. And this is linked to the energy system, but also to 
household heating, which is still based in many places on coal and wood burning. But there are other countries that are also seeing very significant impacts of air pollution on uh, human health. On the side of chemical pollution, it is clear that Europe has the best and strongest system to look at risks of chemicals. It is embedded in the European Chemicals Agency and the REACH legislation, and of course also in the European Food Safety Authority in Parma. But even then we know that we will have to look at the chemical system and move it in line with uh, the sustainability criteria. So asking ourselves the serious question about is it fit for purpose for to fight climate change, to move to a circular economy, and to move towards an economy that protects human health will be the next step. And the iceberg here uh, also has the meaning that a lot of it is below the water. We don't know yet. Uh, and that is where we should focus our knowledge. We also know that about 100 million of Europeans live in air pollution that is above the health standards. And we've seen the impact of the measures of the corona crisis uh, this is mainly linked to road traffic, and in many places we've seen that changes are possible and that people have uh, been living in less uh, air pollution uh, prone areas. Industrial pollution is a positive story. We've seen emissions uh, decreasing of almost every single industrial pollutant, which is a very positive signal for uh, not only human health, uh, food safety, but also for biodiversity. We have seen these challenges, we dealt with them in the past, well, primarily through what we have called environmental policy integration, making sure that the environment is taken up in other policies. But we have to be uh, honest here, this has been in many cases not very successful. If we look at 25 years, of integrating environmental standards in transport, we have to come to the conclusion that aviation, but also navigation and also land uh, transportation with cars and vans and trucks has not delivered. And that has not been because we don't have cleaner engines. Those are the objective of the legislation, but primarily because we drive more, we fly more, and globalization has stimulated an enormous increase in international navigation. So we, we need to reflect on the real driving forces and probably not sweep the floor with the faucet still open. We see the same in agriculture, where the greening of the common agricultural policy has been largely ineffective, although well intended. A lot of the pollution to soil, water, air, and food is still there. Unsustainable practices are still putting a threat to biodiversity and natural capital. And we see this in the critical nitrogen inputs to the agricultural areas in Europe. Another, we have been jumping maybe to, to conclusions that were too quick. If we would have done what some would have preached on biofuels 15 years ago, we may have seen an enormous impact on biodiversity because we would have traded agricultural land and biodiversity massively to use biofuel in a century, in a, in a century old technology called the combustion engine, which we now understand has little future in a sustainable mobility system. So what is then? The, the way to go. Well, we think in the agency in our report that systemic change, focusing on the food system, and I didn't say agriculture because that is only one part of the food system. The energy system, the mobility system, and the built environment are absolutely critical in looking at the interlinkages. We need policy frameworks that address these systemic challenges and also address policy gaps like food, like land and soil, like chemicals, and I'm very happy to say that those are, of course, embedded now in the European Green Deal to a, a, a serious extent. It also means leveraging the power of cities, businesses, and communities. It's obvious that this is not just work for central governments because they will entail serious societal uh, shifts as well. 
it means that we will have to speed up and scale up, experiment, accelerate, and institutionalize solutions that will lead us to a more stable, sustainable society. And Europe is conducting policies to support that. At the same time, we have to be clear, we will also have to phase out and break down unsustainable practices. And the sooner we do that, the more space we create for the green solutions to break through and to create an economy that is fit for purpose under the boundary conditions of the 21st century. And of course, this is where some of the conflicts will be because of vested interests, because of uh, stepping out of things in which we feel comfortable, but it is a step we need to take, which is why I think we need enabling conditions. And I think the Just Transition Fund, the, the money that is made available now under the the funds to get out of this corona crisis can play a major role indeed in enabling stepping out of unsustainable practices and stimulating sustainability. The biggest risk we see in terms of investments is that we would stick to what is called marginal efficiency gains. We keep investing in the, the systems that we have, the technology that we've known for a long time and making it marginally more efficient. Now, any economist or engineer will tell you that this is costly and it has by definition marginal limits and it will lead, so investors say, to stranded assets. And I would say on top of that, if you don't want stranded assets, you don't want stranded regions or stranded workers either. So moving from that logic, which has no future and will not bring us to the European Green Deal in 2050, we need to look at investments that are transitional towards the future. I would like to end with two slides in conclusion. I think our report shows that we do have to focus on implementation in the member states. We have to do things better. We need to stick to our promises because that would mean that the picture looks different already. But on top of that, we need to use sustainability as the guiding principle and do things in a much more systemic way. The third conclusion is that we need to make the right investments, transformative investments, and not marginal efficiency gains in dead-end streets. And in order to do that, we will need to foster innovation, not only in technology, but I think throughout society. And my last slate, slide makes the clear link with the post-corona time. When we presented our SOER in, in December, uh, early December, the week thereafter, the European Commission presented its a European Green Deal, and pretty soon thereafter, we were in the corona period. I think we need to understand the links between these elements. We need alignment, indeed, between the stimulus money and the European Green Deal objectives, has been, as has been made so clear by uh, Commission President von der Leyen, but also by Prime Minister Conte and uh, the, the President of the European Parliament, Sassoli. I think it's important to avoid double costing. If we grow out of this crisis without regard for sustainability, we will pay now to get out of the crisis and we will then pay again to clean up the unsustainability effects of that economic recovery. I also think it's stimulating us to give fundamental answers to a question about our disturbed relationship with nature the signals we are getting from the planet, so to speak, are rather obvious and we need to take them seriously. And I think we also can find solutions that are a response to Europe's position in a world that is increasingly complex, is dealing with risks and uncertainty. I would like to stop my presentation here by thanking the many, many Italian colleagues who have contributed to the SOER uh, report. They are in ISPRA, they are in many other institutions. We cherish the very valued uh, relationship which we have with the Italian colleagues and we think that collectively we can provide knowledge and understanding that will be needed in the next decade and decades to make this European Green Deal a success and become the sustainable society that we are collectively, collectively aspiring. Over to the colleagues in ISPRA now. Thank you very much. Grazie, grazie al direttore Hans Bruinix che mi 
thank you for uh, your contribution. I'd love for you to stay tuned on because we'll have many questions from the people following us on social media here on our ISPRA page. And we'd like now to move on. And from the data presentation of the SOER, now we move on to the yearbook data presentation. And before leaving the floor to our guests, we have another video for you from ma made by ISPRA TV, and that is uh, a summarizing of m the most important data. State of the environment in Italy. This is a short overview of and, s and summarize summary of the most important data. Biodiversity. What is under threat? 23% of mammals, 90% of reptiles, 36% of amphibial creatures. Climate. 2018 remains the hottest year with an anomaly of more than 1.71 degrees Celsius above average. Air pollution. More than 21% 21, 21 of, uh, of stations, of train stations, has been measured and they have yielded bad results, as well as many other points in cities that severely endanger the health of citizens. A very important species of bees is getting extinct, as well as the, and we also registered an incrementation in allergies our domestic waters for we have here is um, a short summary both for lakes for underground water and for rivers and the first data was uh, the parts that are in line with the objective the second data would provide the ones that we still need to work on sea and coastal areas 90% of the water is of excellent quality. The rest needs still for the improvement. As for the soil, um, the consumption of soil is 7.64%, and there is a growing uh, rate of reusing the soil. As for waste, we have an increase of 2%, but also an increase in the amount of waste that we do recycle, but still need further work. As for electromagnetic fields, there are uh, 672 um, implants that are above the limits. And for noise, we have 43.5% of the noise so uh, sources that are above the average and the limit that has been established. As for uh, geological hazards, we had 2,433 um, small earthquakes, but we had also some major ones in the last years. And finally, for chemical agents, Italy is the third produ producer of chemical agents in Europe after Germany and France, and it's number 10 all over the world. The process for the evaluation and authorization and the release of certificate is successful in 84% of cases, and we're working towards improving this number. We also have a positive sign on the field of uh, knowledge about the environment, where there is a further spread of this information. Thank you very much for your attention. Unfortunately, I was not provided with the video in advance, so I could not give you all the details because the screen was playing it too fast. I hope you still got a glimpse of what were the most important data. Now, these were the data recollected for you and summarized in this data that were presented in a very suggested manner, but now I would like to elaborate on these further. And Mr. Bratti uh, has a presentation for us. And please, Mr. Bratti, could you please, based on what the yearbook has yielded us in terms of result, tell us what the position of the country is and where it stands within Europe? Well, first of all, thank you very much. 
all of our guests that are connected, particularly the d director of the EEA, the executive director, Mr. Brunig, with whom we're working uh, very closely. And I would like to compliment him on the amazing work that the agency is currently carrying out because they managed also to engage member countries more and more. We've already seen uh, a lot of data, data that has been collected and have been also presented in various types of uh, products. So in this short presentation, we tried to um, give through two lenses, uh, the historical evolution and the indexation, to give a trend an outlook, an idea of where we're standing right now in terms of the state of the environment of our country compared to the rest of Europe. And we try to follow in detail the chart that has been shown before by the SOER. So looking at the free projects of the seventh EU Environment Action Program, we have natural capital capital, we have low carbon and resource efficient economy, as well as health and well-being for citizens. We try to create a link uh, with the two driving forces at the national level. One is the European Green Deal. The other one are the, the 17 goals of the 2030 Agenda. But speaking about natural capital, the situation is not very different from the overall European situation. There is a, a enormous threat to our biodiversity, a tremendous loss of biodiversity in our country. And as we can see from this chart here, if we look at the terrestrial protected areas, particularly after the approval of the uh, law for the institution of new parks, the law 394, we have uh, had an increase in protected areas, and this concerns both uh, green spaces, national parks, regional parks, and even if in, uh, even in the recent national laws, there has been a drive, a push towards uh, fostering those areas. We have issues, important issues when it comes to the intrusion of invasive alien species, and they quite often have an important impact, not just by altering the ecosystem, but also by creating a series of ecological problems. If we just look at the data from 2017, we have more than 200 species. That's more than we had from 19 to 1900 to 1979. So that's is a incredibly big threat. The protected marine areas have increased. We have two more uh, in 2018. Within the European strategy for marine protected areas, we have seen uh, an important amount of micro, micro and macro waste. Uh, into, we're speaking about plastics. And this is a topic that we really uh, care about, and we're working also in terms of research on this in order to understand what kind of menace microplastic might have, what impact it has on the different wildlife and different species. And this is obviously not the situation of the great uh, Asian oceans, but it is still a situation that we need to t keep under check. We have also uh, created this uh, very specific work on the bird fauna. We have looked at six long-range uh, migrating bird species. We did ringing with on them, and we looked at the migration data. And what we found is that there have been changes based on climate changes. Bec and uh, we looked how well they adapted, how resilient they are. And the data has been quite reassuring because only a third of the species has, uh, pardon me, it was not reassuring because only a third managed to adapt. And this is uh, the living proof that even on the bird wildlife, there's a strong pressure of put on by climate change. And this is a menace for this kind of uh, um, 
uh, animal species. In terms of soil consumption, um, despite the various crises you see here on uh, the chart, with the general trends, which is the uh, the, do the dark dots, it is obviously not a certain. It's not an assertion, but it's a it's a calculus. So if we look at the SDG targets from the 2030 agenda, uh, to reach that level um, in 2050, we have to keep up the work and we have also to face a challenge because also looking at the 2050 goals by the the one the goals for 2015 of the EU are very hard to reach probably. And now looking at the um, geographical uh, composition of our country, obviously it makes it clear that we are quite vulnerable. We have uh, here the um, pinpointed the areas that are particularly vulnerable where we had landslides and landslides are still a big factor in our country. We have started a new portal in order, a new platform in order to also involve citizens in um, in a process of citizen signing in order to have a better mapping of them. So if we look at different indicators, we proceeded with the methodology uh, that has been experimented and approved by the uh, the sustainability index used, uh, well, which is used since quite some years by our company. There is a uh, a specific index, and this index tells us that the trend, as uh, Mr. Brunig has shown us before, is a trend that is telling us that the situation needs monitoring. It's a negative situation overall, and even through the strategy b launched by the European Commission a couple of days ago on the protection of biodiversity, safeguarding biodiversity, we need strong implementations. We need to follow it to the word and it needs also to be uh, fostered. Climate change, uh, CO2, and other uh, climate harmful gases. Here, the, there is an important change, but looking over the time, looking also at the international agreements, we have a reduction of uh, uh, GHGs. This happened mostly in the energy sector, what we mean by this is both uh, transportation, mobility, and also house building, as well as the creation of energy. Energetic indicators are important. We showed on, on some other slides by the um, president of the European Agency. There has been a registration of a higher use of renewable electric energy. Where at a plus 17 percent work very close to hitting the goals that we set for ourselves at a European level in the 2020-20 goals. This year we finally managed to achieve this and if we look on the right chart we see if we compare the blue line which is the um, uh, GDP and the lowest the CO2 emissions the green one, to be clear. So if we look at them, we see that they are diverging, so the decoupling, so um, a trend to a reverse trend to what has happened for economy, where one is going up and one is going down, so we're improving economy while decreasing CO2 emissions. This is something that used to be very much linked to things that were linked uh, in, the, in the last century, even at the end. Now we are um, going towards some estimates for 2020. Now, we are looking at what happened during the lockdown period. So we have compared a series of projections um, divided by, by sectors. So from the energy production to the uh, indus industry of transportation. So we have a reduction by 2020 of five percent more or less a uh, five and a half percent of co2 emissions which is obviously an important reduction but this shows us how transportation has an important impact on this data as well as energy um, production so 
particularly for mobility and transportation, we are working very hardly in order to achieve this uh, targets, those goals we set for ourselves, but we have to do that uh, with a joint action. So if we look at the MPI codec, uh, index, pardon me, we see a positive uh, outcome. The same holds true for um, the use of uh, resources and as well as um, recycling and separate waste collection. Basically, the bottom line is the, is the same f compared to what the uh, director of the EU agency told us. So there's been a decoupling. So the red line, which is the production, the generation, pardon me, of uh, urban waste, is more or less following both the um, GDP as well as also the expenditures for uh, the families, for family cons for the products consum consumed by families. What has increased is the numbers of the uh, separate collection of waste, and there has been an important in increment and in increase in uh, 2018 and 2019. And we gave you another graph here. And let's see what happened during the COVID. Uh, there has been a drop, an important drop, in the pr generation of waste of almost uh, 12 percent. If we look at the projections here from, 20, from uh, 2009 to today, there's not been a huge drop. There's not a whole lot of difference. It's a quite linear trend, to be fair. Well, probably there will be uh, a difference of, of almost 10 percent in 2020, which is mostly because of this lockdown period, which has been also a period of, very, uh, of great uh, economic difficulties. So what we see that is positive is the increase of uh, the uh, separate collection of waste, but obviously the production side is still la a bit lackluster. But we still have to work on the production despite this progress we made. So I'd like to show these two graphs because they concern our uh, and information that is very relevant. That's been also in the SOER in the um, material consumption and the resource productivity. How to keep afloat the GDP, the dotted line. If we look from 28 forward, so the great economic crisis, if we look at this, there's been an in interesting process of making a more efficient use of resources. So the ability to keep the level of well-being high and making a better use of materials, having a circular use of uh, materials. Now, if we look at the right, there is this index of uh, cir circular use of the materials. This is a, basically a projection no, we did on um, the Italian Institute for uh, Statistics material, and we have an efficiency index. We are well about the average of the European countries, of the countries of the European Union. And if we look at another uh, more complex index, the carbon footprint, if we look at it, and if we compare to the other 27 EU countries, our value, we see that our carbon footprint of our productive activities is lower than the average of the EU countries, proving that we have a certain efficiency in Italy in our production apparatus. So but on circular economy and on monitoring this circular economy, we want to point out an important issue together with the EEA and the EC, we have decided to double down on the sustainable development goals and to focus in October on the monitoring program of the circular economic data and values. And we would like to stress 
that this is a very important topic which has the highest degree of priority and our production apparatus even in a phase of growth now uh, can give an important contribution to the entire European Union. Now environment and well-being is a topic that's particularly important right now after the pandemic or which are, which is still ongoing to be fair and that is very vivid in our memory so why temperature temperature uh, is an indic indicator that could have been inserted in the part of climate change but i would like to remind you we're kind of forgetting it that in 20 in in 2003 with a very strong heat wave there were all over 7,000 deaths in Italy and these are very grim numbers uh, obviously 33,000 of the pandemic um, that fell victim to pandemic are worth but I mean 7,000 deaths by heat is definitely a number that should not be underestimated in terms of what this means for the average health and well-being of a population. Air quality. Inter when looking at air quality, we have also seen an improvement. If we look at the indicators at the European level, and if we look at the indicators from the World Health Organization, we are still quite far away from which should be um, optimal values. But if we look at the breach of the, the limits, we have had a slight increase in registered in the over 100 monitoring stations that have been installed in Italy. So this is something, again, to keep in, keep in mind. And this happens mostly in the um, in the north, but also in some areas here in Lazio. So we are breaching the limit and we have also elevated values um, for the NH3 pollution. And this is a trend that has been uh, displayed before by Mr. Brunig and uh, yeah, when it comes to to this pollution, uh, there is a tendency to improvement. But yeah, even here, we managed to have a comparison, if you look at this slide, between what happened during the lockdown in March and the average concentration of pollutants from 2013 to 2018. So we took March as a the month of reference for all years. So if you look at it, we have very two different, very, very different outcomes here, pardon me. If we look at the PM10 values, the reduction value due to the lockdown has been widespread and has been not very consistent in its pattern. In 2018, we have a drop of more than 30 percent but we had other areas where we have red dots or brownish dots or light brown where we have increases why did this happen because in March we had because of uh, air currents at high altitude a transportation of strong um, a transportation of those particles from the Caucasus to our nation. So if we look at um, N2A3, we have higher values. If we look here at the dots, they're all blue. So we, it's interesting how this high values have dropped. So let me reiterate, these are situations, Did these are uh, outcomes that are obviously good for the environment, for our lungs, but we have to keep monitoring them because working, let's say, on the methodology and the different uh, types of transport and even making uh, our energy s uh, system more efficient, it is possible to still achieve further improvement.
sistema dei, dei pesticidi. Eh, voglio ricordare che... Pesticides, I want to recall that the strategy which has been adopted recently on biodiversity, the goal is reducing by 50% the use of pesticides, those of, that have chemical nature. So if we had a glimpse on the distribution for agricultural use, so the graphs on the left, there has been a slight diminution as for fungicide. Well, the, the, the same not goes, doesn't go for um, insecticides and herbicides. And the same thing we can uh, s um, detect in surface waters and groundwaters, uh, there are still big amounts that are over the environmental, the quality environmental standards um, indicated at European level. If we remain in the field of agriculture, we were talking about of uh, agricultural pressure. These are the ammonia emissions. We, there's been a huge discussion in our country about this. So the upper part of this graph is the concentration of ammonia in general, and the red dot line shows the concentration produced by agriculture. So it's a clear-cut example that intensive farming have a huge influence on this parameter, even though, as you can see with your own two eyes, there's a, a continuous diminishing of this. Um, so the uh, exceeding of, uh, um, of um, regulatory norms for 5G's uh, electromagnetic fields, I believe that this theme will be a hot debated one also for control structures like ours. We are engaged and we will be more and more engaged in the future. There's an index for environment and health. We use this index on hair quality. And as I said before, this shows us an improving trend yet not an improving one that would allow us to stick and reach the goals that have been set out by the um, WHO. On this regard, since we have pressing requests, more and more requests from the institutions, but also from citizens, there's this need to understand how a pandemic like the one we are living in is linked with situations to be found in environmental um, pollution. All this pushed us to launch two uh, projects with research institutes and environmental institutes, those on the field that are responsible for data detection. These two hours are really important projects, and I trust that they will provide an answer about this link between the two, both on a epimediologic level and also on an interactive level that maybe they, they can show that this virus or other virus or other microorganisms can be linked to the pressure on the environment. So environment and uh, health become one and both become a priority. Um, I'm not going to talk about the many in environments we have, I mean, engagements we have. Uh, Conte was talking beforehand about the Benessere Italia control room, so the Italian well-being control room. But we're also engaged on biodiversity. We're also uh, engaged in the National Plan on Energy and Climate, as well as Copernicus and the marine strategy. To conclude, I do agree and I fully share the warnings and the worries that have been sent and have been actually um, recalled by Hans Brunig, I brought here some sentences that were taken from this beautiful book written by Aurelio Pecelli, 100 pages for the future. Already in the 1980s, he was saying in such a really important phase of economic development, and there was still threats that were visible due to pollution, to great pressure on our common good environment. He was saying 
that we have to make some sacrifices, but there are certainly minor to those we would do in a different condition. Nowadays, we are witnessing a totally different framework, one in which the Green Deal, as it has been said by the President Sassoli and the Prime Minister and the words that have been uttered by um, Commissioner von Leyen, the Green Deal is the core of this new idea of development. For those who have worked tirelessly on these teams, and I believe that it has to be for all of us a big satisfaction and a huge responsibility seeing this journey coming into reality. The bad note is that it took us 40 years to realize that the way beforehand was probably not the right one. Thank you. Thank you very much to Executive Director Bratti. It's better late than ever, as some say. I mean, it took us 40 years, but we got there. These are the data for the yearbook that collect those also uh, at the European level that are shared by the 21st regional and provincial, provincial agencies together in the uh, Institution for the Protection of Environment that are fundamental to give the yearbook its profile. As for the third report that we're going to show this morning, I will give the floor to the Vice President of National System for the Protection of the Environment, Carlo Emanuele Pepe, because he will show us this data. Thank you very much. First of all, I, wanna th I want to thank the distinguished guests that took part to our session earlier this morning. I want to thank Hans Brunig that is still following us. Again, I want to thank Ispra, the director and the president. And as you said, I want to recall that Ispra, alongside 21st agencies, they got together in this national system of the protection of the environment. Now, let us move to the intervention that will end up in a video. The current health emergency proved once more how our planet is big yet finite. It is also reminded how, how intertwined the relationship between health and environment is. They have a fragile balance, and every detail and every single component contributes to determine the world in which we live. The pandemic has brought down, has turned down some alibi excuses. In face of concrete threats, we change our habits. And we showed it these days. The challenges ahead of us can longer be postponed. In order to tackle them in the most effective way, it is pivotal to start from shared data, which have been collected scientifically in an homogeneous way and on the largest possible scale. There's a growing general and genuine interest towards the environment. It evokes strong feeling, but in managing it, we must not be guided by our emotion only. Instead, instead it, has be, it has to be understood, studied, protected for a better quality for each one of us. The National System for Environmental Protection is the Italian institution responsible for monitoring, controlling, and researching environmental issues. It's a public, homogeneous, impartial, authoritative service that employs more than 10,000 people, including specialized technicians, inspectors, researchers, engineers, physicists, and chemists, and so far and so forth. The investment comes down to just a little over 12.5 per citizen, so the equivalent of one pizza per year. We create a system that works with and for politics, tourism, entrepreneurs, companies, individual citizens. Each gesture, each deed that we do daily interacts somehow with the SMP activities, tap water, lift we use, the food we eat, the air we breathe, the very sea in which we swim, the green area where we work out, the weather forecast we consult, the mobile phone we use to talk to our loved ones. Over 200 locations scattered throughout Italy guarantee that SBN is present where it is really needed. 
We have a network of laboratories that combine certified excellence in the way in the analysis of air, water, soil, waste, and food. An apparatus capable of mutual assistance that is optimized and deploys its resources whenever and wherever they're needed the most. This is a system based on a decades-long heritage of environmental control and monitoring, offering third-party technical support to those in charge of managing the development of the territory. So, to disposal of local authorities and not only. As the previous speakers have said, the protection of biodiversity and coastal marine environment, soil use, air pollution and waste management are some of the issues to add to the new challenges of emerging pollutants and the fights against climate change. We're bringing everything back to the lepta, the essential levels of technical environmental performance. Our main benchmark for assessing our work. Now, I would like to take you to a little trip around Italy. Let us start from Lazio. Right. The Sacco Valley in the province of Frosinone has concentration level of pollutants which can be comparable to those in the Po Valley. The regional office of Arpa Lazio has commissioned a study that brings together all the meteorologic information and an annual assessment to define the dispersive characteristics of the territory. This is a really important hearty theme, but we are witnessing an increasing trend. Now, let us go to uh, another place um, in Valle d'Aosta. The monitor, the glacier, the ice glacier is the effect of climate, climate change. The Alps have lost an enormous uh, part of their surface already from middle of the 80s. ARPA Valle d'Aosta monitors glaciers, often alongside ARPA Lombardy and Piedmont, to understand the current dynamics and feed modeling tools with whom they can trace the future of, glaci of glaciers according to different climate scenarios. Now, let's go all the way down to Calabria. Um, they use the same drones, so remote pilot aircraft systems with multispectral cameras to map the prairies of Posidonia Oceanica. This is a an an fundamental uh, environmental indicator, cradle of biodiversity and natural barrier against coastal erosion, and was the protagonist of a recent cartoon made by ISPRA. We're still seeing some images of of what I'm talking about. Before we move on to the next surgeon, we will uh, go in a short time uh, to Lombardy. We're working to improve some sites in Lombardy as well. We'll see this in a bit. So in the reclamation work of Sessa San Giovanni, so for former steel production that um, gave labor to many, many thousands of people, one of the most important ones in Europe. So there was a radiometric anomalies during the reclamation. So radiometric testing protocols have been done with management of sub radioactive materials. This is important and has to be stressed. It was fundamental then to come up with rules, opinions, procedures to be put in common to manage similar situation that might arise in other places. So they have the know-how and the professional professionalism uh, to support them. Let's move now to Puglia, where ARPA described the first seaward bloom event in the Mediterranean Sea of a deep dinoflagellate proocentrum chicoquiens has been reported in the port of Brindisi. The blossoms of this microscopic organism have been witnessed in China, in Japan, in Japan, in Korea, and Mexico. Due to uncertain and complicated identification, we find it quite hard to assess whether it's a cryptic series or rather it has been introduced with international marine maritime traffic. 
This is just one of the several activities. Let's not talk about. Let's not forget to talk about um, sea tourism. This is the start for the blue flags. We have uh, Calabria, Liguria, and Emilia Romagna here, to, and this is monitored by the ministry. And one of the aspects we monitor is the presence of plastic in plastic. Now we are in Camp the region Campania. Last year, we tackled the issue of uh, urban waste. We're talking almost 225,000 tons of waste material, and there is a huge interception of this waste, and there is a, a high percentage of um, organic waste, and we have big deficiencies in handling this kind of waste and we are selling them to different areas in order to be managed and this obviously has some co bad consequences for economy and the environment. Now from Campania we move to uh, Balisilicata in a couple of seconds. We look at incineration may also bring us some, uh, some good aspects. Um, wind energy is the future has a stronger perspective for us. Very often we have those in areas where people live and this has created some irritation and in Basilicata unfortunately despite all the monitor monitoring has not been able to answer the demand because there is no specific law in place that for uh, you know, unified guidelines. Leaving you with uh, a couple of more images from this region. Let's move to Liguria, where I work as a local director. We all were in, we were shattered to pieces by the tragedy of the Morandi Bridge collapse. ARPA has has allocated the funds and the energies to um, re partially rebuild and to handle the demolition. Reconstruction is still going on. We have a evaluation of the weather conditions, also of the geological aspects and other aspects that are important for this process. We also monitor the air pollution there, so we take everything under check. This is a very recent, um, very recent picture. From four in the morning to midnight, we gave very important contributions. We made performed analysis, and those. This data that we collected was crucial. Now, we talked about some reports and reports. We have the technical committee with the joint committee with the uh, Christina Frisa, which is the coordinator there. They have done a great work. They have been so precious for us. The collaboration has been greatly appreciated. And uh, obviously, this is uh, work all collected in one big and that explains the outcomes and the things me measured in the national system. It is something that has been required by all regional and provincial directors, or my colleagues, which I'd like to greet. And this is a report that gives you a complete picture uh, that is up to date and is also three-dimensional of all things going on in our country. And we also will keep up the good work. This is a document with an incredibly rich document in terms of quantity of data, and it has been a great effort for all bodies that participated in this effort to collect this data. And this is an important opportunity, again, to share this knowledge and, uh, yeah, to give them access to this data bank. Thank you very much. Thank you to Vice President Pepe and all the researchers working for ISPRA. All this agency carrying out a fundamental job for our country. Now, the time has come to have a debate, so to say, with our spectators and those who have been following us. They posted their questions on our social pages, on ISPA social pages. And I remember that this event can be visible on ISPRA TV alongside our social ch channels, Facebook and YouTube. Now, if the control room is kind enough to send me some of these questions, I will try to read. I need a lens, but I'll try that notwithstanding. 
Angelo Martinelli asks quite a complex and articulated question. He wants to know what are th what is the strategy on um, fossil fuels and when are they going to be over? The new uh, agriculture um, common policy will be able to eliminate the effective contribution, whatever. Well, let's uh, stick to the first question. Um, Executive Director, I think um, he can answer to this, I hope he, uh, he understood it. So the first question for Hans Brunig. Well, um, from a European Union perspective, the mix of uh, energy uh, in every member state is the choice of the member state. But once we agree on collective targets for uh, decarbonization of the economy, it is obvious that this will imply that we move out of fossil fuels as soon as we can. Otherwise, we will not be cutting uh, our emissions by 50 or 55 percent by 2030, and we will not become carbon neutral. And I think that that means that one has to make very careful choices when investing today uh, in fossil fuels, be it coal or oil, and also gas. We did a study three years ago, which illustrates that by 2030, uh, up to 30% of those investments could already be stranded assets. Uh, so we, we have to be careful there. The other clear signal is on the financial side. The European Investment Bank has decided that from next year onwards, it will no longer fund uh, fossil fuel projects. I think that is an incredibly important and strong signal from uh, the capital and investment uh, side. And I think thirdly, when we look at the breakthrough of renewables and the price of renewables in most places, and I would say that is explicitly also the case in the Mediterranean part of Europe, it is obvious that renewables also without subsidies are more than price competitive uh, with fossil fuels. So from an economic perspective, from an investment perspective, but of course even more from a climate mitigation perspective, we should move out of fossil fuels as soon as we can. And that would be greatly helped by stopping subsidies, environmentally harmful subsidies to the fossil fuel industry. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now let's move on. There's another question. One that uh, you've probably heard again in the next, in the, in the previous weeks. Um, it appears that people are really interested in this. How come the domestic use masks are not considered as particularly dangerous uh, waste and, not, and have to be thrown in the general waste? Uh, it has been a long discussion. We actually stick to um, the guidelines set by um, the WHO. This is a mainly um, health care problem. In all European countries, they all adopted and followed this guideline. I mean, putting aside some regions, and we have the, our colleague PP, like, for example, in Liguria, they had a different choice. But m most of the places, the masks, so the DPI, so protection for individual protection, have been considered those brought by citizens in their daily life, normal daily life, they had to be disposed in um, general waste. As for the material coming from structures that dealt with pandemics, so hospitals, for example, these are considered with a different code. They are considered as special waste, as ad waste or not. And we gave clear indications with the WHO to treat the waste coming from companies as special wastes, not dangerous ones. So there are three types of wastes. Now, and I shall conclude, today there's a development to try and make sure that masks can, can be made of risk. Uh, materials that can be recycled. And I think that some of these proposals 
are going to be handed over today and some models by some company are going to be presented today, some that can replace the so-called single-use masks. So the question is evolving and is trending. The differentiation today uh, is done by sticking to WHO guidelines and by aligning ourselves with what happened in the rest of Europe. Well, good. Let's move on with new questions. Uh, Roberto Balegni is asking, which solution should be adopted to um, favor a more efficient um, share uh, of information on environment from science-based world to the interested ones? Well, this is an engagement that we're trying um, to stick to on our daily life. We are aware that many times we have an enormous heritage of data that we are not able to um, share with the citizens. So this is something we're working on. We have a, a team of com people uh, working in communication that are really passionate and they're working together to improve starting from our site, so SMPA website, and I invite you to have a look at it, have a glimpse on it. Until all sites of um, other agencies, our social pages, our YouTube pages, to make sure that we're able, sort of real time, to share our new data, our new discoveries. It is also fundamental being able to meet some of those are really interested in hearing these things. So meeting, discussing, and exchanging hab opinions is definitely another good practice. It's actually not one way. It's, it's a win-win situation. So this group that I mentioned are working really hard. And I want to recall this very important thing. This is made of people that are really young, that have a different um, age span, so to say. Are they linked together? And the entire communication together is better in the network. They are doing their best. Gianni Bregorina has another question. Mr. President, what are the integration goals with the in university system? There are more and more courses on environmental expertise that have to be inserted in the institutional level. So we're moving in a, in a future where these themes will be pivotal what place will they have in the academic system, in the university system? I might ask this to Hans Brunick. Okay, thank you. Thank you for this uh, question. I think it's a critical question. I think our university system uh, has been focusing on specialized knowledge and deep knowledge for the most part. And I think that has delivered fantastic science and we've benefited greatly as a society from that. But at the same time within science and within academia, the field of system science and understanding complex systems and how they impact society has also been growing. And I think uh, we really need to focus on, on teaching students and on, on stimulating researchers to make the connections between the deep knowledge that they have and to understand that their knowledge is part of a broader uh, environment in which we need to connect to understand the systems that we need. And I think there are two critical elements there. One is starting from the challenges which we know we have in the next decades. How are we going to deal with climate change, with biodiversity, with a different food system that requires inputs from technology people, natural scientists, economists, lawyers, political scientists, we need to bring them together around the challenges. I think that is one thing. And secondly, I think this can be stimulated much more by science policy that is funding integrated and more systemic type science rather than uh, the type of science that is highly fragmented. So if the scientific community and society in funding science, and most uh, science is funded by society in this field, if they can understand that necessary change, we will get there. And you can put it in one simple phrase. If you want science for transitions, you will also need a transition in science. And I think your question was uh, very much to the heart of that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Allora, uh, Chiara Bolognini, mi chiede, quali saranno le 
what are the new habits that will be implemented first for instance priority healthcare in order to create fast and swift changes the responses well my opinion is that well this probably is a better question for a political decision maker but anyway i believe that this pandemic will have us face a new and, com and radically changed type of society both in terms of dynamics of how work is performed and accelerating a series of processes that were probably already enact but they have gotten accelerated greatly by seeing how we can use the digital devices for work i mean look at what we are living here right here now this um this day we are presenting everything we're broadcasting online and this will change this will impact our ways of life our ways of of our mobility and mobility will be definitely a crucial topic and it will go through a change a radical change and obviously as always when there is a great crisis from a crisis you can only move on if you restore a previous situation or maybe you try to get a glimpse of what is positive the positive outcomes of a crisis in order to develop a new system to go forward with innovation and we talked about it before sustainability is the main topic green deal is at the focus is the main pillar of this new innovation for a better development we shall not confuse online activity with on life activity so there will be a need for physical contact for for talking eye to eye we need to embrace digitalization and the acceleration of this process in order to create a type of uh, daily activity that is different from what we had before and that will influence our habits our ways of life but i repeat this will be done if we have a path that leads us ahead it, it is not necessary that this path is to be taken for granted because many take for granted that we will go come out of this pandemic with a different system as if as if there was natural but no this needs solutions this needs concrete steps to be implemented it needs proposals suggestions and some sectors have already undergone drastic change and we have to go down this path yeah and we hope for this for the vice president another question looking at the law reforming the national environment system what are the changes in perspective for the system and what do we expect for the future well the advantages certainly for the report system there's obviously a certain way progress we had referendums we had a path that we followed immediately afterwards we had a law a national law and that is an interesting question and I'm very glad to answer it there's been a national law that created ISPRA as it is right now and then there have been um, regional initiatives that the local agencies in 1989 we started and the last one spawned in 20, 2007 so being reunited in this national system has allowed us to know all of the combined activities so the opportunity of having at our disposal all of the data collection at a national level from this different agency is a great enrichment for our uh, single competences and our single um, information and obviously we keep growing in the process uh, if I'm not if maybe I'm missing a part uh, there was also part in the future yes so every policy every activity that might concern a single agency is now going to be relevant at a systemic level so we will try to provide 
local solutions, solutions for local agencies, and we will try to be as practical, as pragmatic, and more on point in our uh, work. We are united, and it is important that at the environmental level uh, that we don't forget that we have to help each other. Maybe we need support for a particular event, for a particular project that is uh, in a region and that requires more analysis, requires bigger analytical capacities, uh, and hence requires the help of a different agency. I spoke about the drones that we use both in the Aosta Valley for monitoring the glaciers, but also in Calabria for uh, monitoring different things in their ec local ecosystem, but we use them also for monitoring in uh, waste and waste collection. So sometimes there are synergies between those different agencies and different actions where knowledge becomes shared and we, by sharing it, we grow together and find better solutions. So it's a constant growth that we try to keep up and we've been keeping up hopefully for three years. Next question, Giuseppe from Vicenza wants to know, talking about uh, new pollutants. Do you think that the first question has been um, handled well by ARPA? The vice president wants to answer. Yeah, this is a topic that uh, I've been involved in studying in 2012. It was in Venice back then, in, in the Veneto region, pardon me. We received a note from the ministry or from the region, I think. So. We are from Opera received a note that there was a pollution, an unknown pollution, and it propagated very fastly. And the only agency that was, the only region that was actually taking action was the Piemonte region. And they were asked to handle the case. And ARPA Veneto managed to set up a laboratory and did all the analysis needed for the uh, healthcare units on the region in order to contain the pollutants and uh, enable prevention measures. So from there, there was also an official communication to the authorities and then fo uh, what followed was a process of great public attention and also uh, that had the complete attention of ARPA Veneto and other regional uh, offices in collaboration with the ministry. And this uh, very special um, situation that we had to face, and it was a novelty, we had to research, and you, as you always have to do, and try to find the right tools to handle it for healthcare. Well, I, I think that sums it up. Okay, we have one last question. Uh, and I w would like to remind you that all questions that we were not able to share here, you can send it to our online uh, account, to our email, or on our I um, website, where you will also be given the answers to your questions. So the last question is uh, rather a statement, which is for Director Brunig. One of our viewers wants to know, would it be useful to have a periodic event where you have a sharing of uh, international and national level for sharing our experience on climate change, on biodiversity? Would that be useful? Yes, definitely. And I think this is a great question because that is exactly one of the roles that the European Environment Agency is playing. We. We work with our fundamental network, uh, EIONET, where ISPRA, but a number of other Italian institutions are key partners. And we, we gather around 24 teams regularly in Europe where experts are exchanging the best new information, knowledge, and connected to uh, policies. But we also have a network of environmental protection agencies where ISPRA is also a key partner. And where we also do the same thing, we, we bring together experts around key topics in European policies and in national policies. So there is that exchange. I think that it, it could definitely also be, uh, be strengthened. And that is what we try to do with what we call country visits. When we go to the countries and bring a European perspective, bring it into a national debate and are happy 
uh, to discuss with the experts in the country. And that, that doesn't necessarily have to be uh, with, with uh, a big attention from media or that is really a discussion amongst experts. And we've done that several times in Italy. In fact, I was looking forward to doing this in Italy uh, until the Corona crisis broke out. Uh, but I'm sure that, that we will continue to do that in the future. The other way in which we are trying to do that as an agency is to be the connector between what is discussed in the IPCC, the IPBES, the IRP, and translate that in a European context and connect it also to our national uh, network. So it is, it is a task that we are trying to do, but, but I, I agree probably with the implicit notion in the question can we strengthen that? Can we make that more effective? I'm sure we can, and that is exactly what we are trying to do in our new strategy from 21 to 2030, where the connection with the national contexts will be one of the focal points of the European Environment Agency. Grazie. Grazie al direttore Hans Brunig. Thank you, Director Brunig. I think we have really reached the end of this um, work session, so I'd like to yield the floor to uh, Mr. Bracky, and I would like to also thank all of our viewers, all of the people who connected our honorable guests from this morning session, and also thank those who organized this splendid event. Certainly not an easy thing, not an easy task to accomplish, especially in this situation. And I would like to end with an optimistic message. Italy and Europe are on the same line, on the same path when facing this crisis and when reaching goals towards 2030 and 2050. Italy, allow me this comment, with its companies, its politicians, with a population that is really sensitive and really aware of environmental questions, has to play a pivotal role when it comes to innovation, both in technology and in the way we understand business in Europe, in the world. And I would like to yield the mic to Director Bratti for a conclusion remark. Words to conclude this fruitful day. I want to thank the Prime Minister, Minister of the European Parliament, Sassoli, Minister Costa, and also to Hans Brunig for having been with us throughout this morning. Again, we are carrying out a more and more integrated work that, in my opinion, will deliver to important uh, fruits in the future, important uh, outcomes. I want to thank also my colleague Pepe on behalf of all agencies. I want to th thank also my, our uh, moderator. And last but not least, all our colleagues in ISPRA, those who worked and engaged themselves to make sure this meeting happened that we had to delay because of coronavirus. And it wasn't always easy, but I am confident that the result was a great one. As well as those colleagues in the agencies, and allow me to say from ISPRA, that have done a tremendous job and a specific one to collect all this data, to organize them, we used some new tools, and we're going to be working more and more on new scenarios to work and make sure that our decision, our politician, will have more and more instruments of their availability. Thank you very much again, and I wish you a nice day and good luck to all of us. I just want to add that the data that have been presented earlier this morning are already available on the ISPRA portal. As for the recording of this event, I just wanted to quote another fundamental um, event happening in Bellagio, October 2020, both for ISPRA and for SNPA. What is going to be this about? As I said in my presentation, we're already working with the European Environment Agency through some um, webinars, training webinars, we're going to decide how we're going to do this. If we will have better conditions, so we will have the possibility to have a live event, or we'll have to resort to kind of a mixed way or a fully online way. We 
this uh, will uh, be something we will discuss later on. We are still work we are already working. There's a an important involvement of private internal stakeholders. This uh, afternoon, on that, we're doing a meeting on this with private stakeholders. As I said, the goal is having an indicator, having a roadmap by highlighting the role, the fundamental monitoring role of the activities carried out by the agencies, not only of Italian agencies, but of course of the agencies of the single member states of the European Union. That's the work ahead of us. We are already working. This is already uh, in the works, and I believe and I trust this will be a fundamental moment. So once again, thank you very much to Executive Director Bratti. You will know more about this meeting. Thanks again to all those who have followed us live, those here and those at home. I hope that we will be able to have a live scenario and meet us in person because, as you were saying before, human contact plays a fundamental role. So thank you again from the bottom of my heart, and I wish you a good day.